uh, I got a pretty good advance, you know, but like a pretty good advance for a book, but not a lot of money for travel. You know, the the travel ended up costing about twenty thousand dollars on its own. I think maybe more actually. So I supplemented that with grants. Today's guest wrote a travel memoir, and he was scrappy and fortunate enough to find extra funding to cover the many trips he had to take around the world. Omar Malalam wrote Praying to the West, How Muslims Shaped the Americas. But he found it was hard to tackle that subject matter as a casual observer. He had to find a new relationship with the religion he grew up with and had grown apart from. Now, when I really started to become a, I guess, a character in my own book with more of an, with kind of an arc that I was setting out to, I guess, explore. It was one of my earlier trips. I went to Trinidad and I kept being greeted and treated like a Muslim brother and kind of expected to pray with people. And I found that people were opening up to me because they thought I was, you know, a pious Muslim person and not necessarily as like a journalist, more like a, just like a curious brother. And I felt very conflicted about that. So I felt like I needed to be more, after that I felt like I, I really need to be a lot more transparent with my subjects, but I especially needed to be more transparent with my readers. Omar dives into the whole process, from getting his start as a ghostwriter, to how he landed his book deal, casting his mosques, the editing process with Simon & Schuster, some really insightful tips for writers, and more in today's episode. There's nothing to writing. All you do is sit down at a typewriter and bleed. <laughs> Welcome to The Bleeders, a podcast and support group about book writing and publishing. I'm writer and podcaster Courtney Kosak, and each week I'll bring you new conversations with authors, agents, and publishers about how to write and sell books. Hi, my name is Omar Moalam. I am a journalist, documentary filmmaker, and the author of Praying to the West, How Muslims Shaped the Americas. So I actually know Omar because I taught a few workshops for his pandemic university. So he's watched me teach podcasting, but this was our first time sharing the mic. It's nice to uh, get a chance to experience the Courtney Kosak podcast experience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited about this. I took our daughter out to a movie yesterday, a new uh -huh. movie, and she asked the most profound question. She asked, why do they keep making movies when there are so many movies I haven't seen? And it's like, yeah, why do we keep <laughs> writing books when there are so many books we already haven't read? Okay, well, people have more things to say. <laughs> So funny that Omar's daughter is making grown adults question their career path with her philosophical question. We're fragile. Please don't come for our life decisions. <laughs> anyway, Omar wrote a very interesting and worthy book that we're going to get into. But first, the five questions. When did you first identify as a writer? I think I might have been as young as like seven or eight. Um, I have a very distinct memory of folding up pieces of paper, big pieces of paper into these like six page folded comic books that I would write. Uh -huh. And they were mostly words because I was never a good drawer. So there was just a <laughs> couple of pictures on there and then trying to sell those to my friends and neighbor friends and uh, one of them, this was probably the first reality dose as a writer. One of them told me that their father advised them, because I think I was trying to sell them for two bucks, that their father advised them that they should not pay more than a quarter for my <laughs> book. That's how valuable your art is, sir. And you know what? <laughs> they were right. They were right. That was good fatherly advice. Oh, that's hilarious. Okay, so you started young. What is your all-time favorite book? Um, 
it's funny, I don't feel like I have a very strong connection to a single book, not the way that I do with movies and music. And really? Yeah, no, I get asked this question and I, I never have a proper answer. And um, it, I was just asked it last week. I was teaching at a youth writing camp and we wrapped up on the fifth day and I was like, OK, AMA time. I thought they wanted to talk about craft and stuff. And they were like, what's your favorite book? What books do you love? And I was like, oh, God, this again? <laughs> um, I, I think if I were to pick one, probably 1984, uh, yeah. George Orwell's 1984. And only because I think that was the first book that I read where I felt like I was having a profound reading experience and where I understood the, I guess, commentary uh-huh. In in a book, how you can you can tell a story while also making commentary on the world and on life. And that one resonates with me. So I think that's probably and it's also maybe the one book I've read more than once. <laughs> Interesting. OK, yeah. I like that answer. What's your dream writing routine? Money's no object. Time is no object. What's the fantasy? So first of all, I'm not living in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. <laughs> no. Yeah, You're no. the son of Alberta. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm probably living like, um, I don't know. I'm probably living in Mexico somewhere. Like, okay. doesn't need to be coastal, maybe Mexico City, maybe somewhere in the Middle East, um, somewhere warm and where I can be outside to work. That's the important thing. I want to be comfortably outside to work. And then I think it would it would involve me waking up early as I as I always do, but actually getting to work within like the first hour, hour and a half of waking up and then not having to read a single email oh, until yes. maybe the end of the day. Oh. You know? And just writing and reading and writing and reading because reading is writing and jotting down notes and scribbling out you know different structures of different sections experimenting with that picking up the phone to call someone to clarify something or to get some quick research and they pick up they pick up on the first ring (laughs) this is a good fantasy (laughs) oh my god it's amazing and they always have time for me That's the crazy thing. They always have time for me. (laughs) And they're never evasive. There's no question (laughs) that is off the record or that they, you know, don't want to be asked. And then I think that, you know, probably around one o'clock, go for a jog, come back, shower, eat, get back to work at about three. And I work till about six and day's over. No more emails. Even when I check their for emails. There's no new ones. Emails illegal. Email <laughs> Not is in illegal. A bad way, but just like we don't have it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's probably my dream routine. Yeah. What is your real writing routine? And yeah. I've been talking to some parents lately, so I'm curious how much your yeah. kids factor into this. Um a fair bit, I think. You know, my my real writing routine honestly is other than the tropical part of it. And the email part of it, it's not that <laughs> far off. Maybe it's actually, maybe it is far off. I mean, my real writing routine is I do wake up early, but I don't usually start working until about nine. And unfortunately, the first thing I do is, you know, check emails and messages uh-huh. and get caught up on all that stuff. And that could take that. I mean, that could take me till one o'clock sometimes. And then I go for a jog. <laughs> and I think about what I want to write and I do a lot of planning. And uh, sometimes if I need to revisit interviews, I'll listen to my interviews on my jog. Or if I'm picking up where I left off, I might take everything that I've written up to that point, all the text, copy it, paste it into like a a text to MP3 file mm-hmm. and I'll listen to it, which is a weird thing to be listening to while you're jogging you know working up a sweat but it it works and then you know get cleaned up and 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 try to work until six or seven you know i i used to be able to go pretty hard i used to be able to just go go and go have dinner and keep going stay up really late but you know that i just i have kids now and i 
it's totally mm-hmm. different. I have a great office. Like I, I are you in your office right now? I am. Yeah, I work with two monitors, two big monitors, and the reason that I do that is because I like to have like word processor transcripts. Um, oh, yeah. You know, all, all, like one monitor is just research and one is just my word processor. And I love that. And so I, I do like to work from my office, but I also have like ADHD and need to change my environments quite frequently. Uh-huh. So I work out of libraries a lot. I probably change environments at least once a day. And I want to say it's, you know, because of the kids, but honestly, it's not because of the kids. It's just like (laughs) before the kids existed, I was doing this too. Is it just pandemic you and your creative work? Like, is that all you have to juggle? No, no, not at all. (laughs) Is there a whole nother job? Yeah, kind of. Like I teach and am a mentor to creative nonfiction writers at the University of King's College in Halifax. I just accepted another teaching job. So I'll be teaching another course in the fall. I have Pandemic University, obviously, that I run, um, have a good team there, but I also teach there as well. I am always probably working on one article and then one big project. So that was the book before and right now it's a documentary. Yeah. Okay. I I relate to that. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, (laughs) I'm I'm a freelancer. Yeah. I But like... I love it. Like, it's a hustle, but that's not just the life I chose, but it's the life that I want. Um, yeah, I, I love having lots of stuff on the go until it overwhelms me and it becomes a burden. And <laughs> and I, you know, I'm just kind of a distractible, burnt out mess. But when the balance is there, it's it's great. I mean, and I think, you know, coming back to having ADHD, I think I that I, say. I thrive in this kind of yeah, I thrive with this kind of situation because I'm I always seek out novelty and and luckily I always have it. Uh-huh. Totally. Okay, what is one piece of writing that makes you jealous you didn't write it? There is a great book called Um Boys, What It Means to Be a Man Today, a great nonfiction book about sort of the the idea of manhood and how we shape good men uh, from the time that they are boys. It's a wonderful book. And it's something that I think about a lot, especially more so now that I have a son as well. But Mm -hmm. it was something that I thought about a lot for years, just dealing with my own, you know, own stresses. And I made a documentary about men's mental health a few years ago as well. So it's something that it's a topic that I've been very interested in for a long time. It's a wonderful book, and uh, the author, Rachel Giza, uh, who's a friend of mine, is just the perfect writer for it. And I say that because this book was based on... (laughs) Okay, so uh, this book was based on an article that she wrote for the Walrus Magazine cover story. And the idea and the program for boys that was sort of at the center of it... It was an idea that I had as well, and I was planning to pitch it to the walrus. And I sat on it, and I sat on it, and I sat on it, and then, like, almost a, maybe two years later, never doing anything about it, saw you that were someone like, else shit somebody wrote someone my else idea. wrote it they, exactly <laughs> right, and for the same magazine that I wanted to write it for, um, and I didn't know Rachel at the time, and so I was like, I was legitimately jealous. <laughs> legitimately i love that (laughs) and then i read the piece and then i read the book and this is coming back to like why she's the perfect person to write it i wasn't even a parent at the time she was a parent of an adopted boy she was uh she's a uh, woman she's a lesbian married to uh, another woman and they adopted this boy and they were trying to raise him you know with their values and we're kind of navigating this world in a very very unique way and it just gave her such a unique perspective and she really was the perfect person to write that book and so yeah i'm happy she did i love that story that's maybe the best (laughs) best one yet (laughs) and and we became friends after uh after that book came out and i had a chance to meet her so So before we really dig into the book, we're going to take a brief detour to talk about Omar's rap career. But just trust me, it's worth it. So 
Very early in the book, you apologize, I guess, or sort of for your sins as a rapper. (laughs) (laughs) When did you first identify as a rapper? I was like, oh Uh, my God, I love this. Here are the rap (laughs) questions. Yeah, I mean, I started rapping probably when I was like, 12, 13, recording on cassettes. And then, you know, I had a little rhyme book with some really, really like obscene things in it. I remember my mom (laughs) finding it once and just being horrified and kind of destroyed. And, oh man, uh, I just, you know, I forgot about that memory for maybe 20, (laughs) 20 years until right this very moment. I think I was so scared that I, I started crying. Uh, anyhow. <laughs> you were like, this is not who I am. This is a different version. It was, yes. Like, you don't understand performance art. <laughs> yeah, I was undeterred. In high school, I figured out how to like record audio and download instrumentals. First of all, I learned that instrumental beats like existed, like beats of like my favorite rap uh-huh. songs existed, and you can download them on Napster. Wow, what an invention. <laughs> And so I re- I just like went out and started recording songs. And I think like by the ninth grade, I had like an LP recorded. I would burn these CDs and figured out how to like print little CD labels and totally. did like the cover and the back. And I must have sold like 30 to 50 of those in junior I high. I that. <laughs> well, here's the thing. It also means that there's like 30 to 50 of those out there in existence. And that is the scariest. That keeps me up at night, Courtney. That is so funny. What were you rapping about? Oh, my God. I was rapping about what rappers <laughs> rapped about. I was using the N word like it was. Oh, it's no. Ba- yes. No, it's bad. It's bad. Look, I was I was like you a sold. weird. I know I was a 14 year old kid. I know. Yes, exactly. No, future. they exist. <laughs> They exist. There's at 30 to 50 ways to cancel me right now if they want. You know what? That's beautiful, though. You're like, this is out there. I sort of have to own it. I have to own it. (laughs) (laughs) You know what? On my first like actual album album that I like had printed and was semi studio recorded. I think I I had the foresight to address that in a song. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so anyway yeah you know 14 year old weird kid one of the only like immigrant families in a small alberta town with like three thousand people who right. you know just didn't fit in in any way also like would watch and re-watch spike lee's malcolm x all the time mm-hmm. and would do like malcolm x impressions and i just really thought that i was the blackest kid in town (laughs) really really did and you know maybe to an extent I was (laughs) I know there is something in that though but oh my god all of this is so fucking funny when did you grow out of it and we're like oh my god (laughs) I grew out of it probably like the very next year I don't know I mean grew like grew out of the like you know, the, the hardcore wanna- phase. <laughs> no, the wannabe black kid, you know? Yeah. But I continue to rap and, you know, I, I continue to record, you know, music. And it's been 10 years since my last album, 10 years since I was a rapper. Last week, I did come out of rap retirement to perform in the youth camps talent show. I was teaching at a youth writing camp and there was a contractually obligated instructor talent show that I initially tried to get out of, but again, it was contractually obligated. (laughs) And uh, I didn't know what else to do. So I just, I quickly, you know, found one of my old beats and did a song and the kids didn't hate it. Give me just a couple lyrics. Oh God. Okay. So it's like, (laughs) it's like my attempt at like a, club song for girls like a body positive club song for girls and the hook is my wife wrote the hook is when life gives you mascara make masquerade okay (laughs) yeah look you gotta 
<laughs> you know, with the right beat, I can I imagine it. It works. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it starts with like ooh she okay, you know the the makeup store Mac yeah okay so it's called Mac face and it starts with like ooh she's got her Mac face on can't take off the mask till the mascara is gone a uh, buxom blonde with bucks to blow Swarovski crust on her bra to the bar she goes <laughs> she's knee deep in books sleeps with texts. Because degrees won't earn themselves, so eats sashimi with her number two pencil. It's her number one, then shoot for creme de nude. I'm not going to keep going. Okay. Well, that officially concludes our rap portion. That was lovely. (laughs) I think it does, doesn't it? (laughs) Okay, so praying to the West... What's the premise? Uh, so Praying to the West is a travel memoir about the lost and ignored and sometimes erased history of Muslims in the Americas. So I grew up Muslim, don't practice it. Uh, Islam haven't for a long time, but have always had sort of a cultural connection to it. And around 2015, 2016, when Islamophobia became you know, quite mainstream with the rise of Trump and other, you know, uh, right-wing populists in the in the Western world. I wanted to address it, but I want to address it in a reported way. And I thought that, you know, if only people knew how far back Islamic history went in the Western world and particularly in the Americas, that it is that the Muslim presence here is as old as any non-indigenous faith, mm-hmm. um, non-indigenous fo- uh, culture. If people knew that, maybe they they wouldn't have so many reasons to fear it if they understood just how it has influenced society, Western society already. And I thought that the best way to do that would be to travel to sort of important Muslim communities in the Americas. So I started in Brazil and went up to the Arctic, two very unlikely places for there to be Islamic history and mosques. Mm -hmm. And I tell the story through existing mosques today and why they exist and the people who built them, the influence that they've had and the influence too that the regions have had on their communities as well. And along the way, I I sort of, um, you know, I I deal with my own complicated relationship with Islam and uh, and with organized religion and self. Yeah, I I mean, I super related to that part of the book because, I mean, I feel like that with Catholicism, like, and I kind of have never been outside of the cultural stuff attached to the religion at all. And so anyway, I found that very relatable. I think it's relatable for a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people who leave their religions just kind of gradually and not because of some sort of traumatic experience will often find themselves coming back to those traditions because they mean something to them. And they are also a way to connect with their families. And that's, for me, that's really what it ultimately is. It's a way for me to connect with my family. So I'm curious, what year did you start the whole process? I want to talk about the book proposal. And then also, and maybe this all ties together, but you have an author's note at the beginning, and it kind of lays out like the rules or the way that you're thinking about the book. And I'm curious how much of that was in the initial proposal, were you like, this is a straight reporting? Were you a piece of it initially? And did you plan on tackling your faith in that way? Or is that something that happened, you know, during the process? This is a great question. So I would say that, so the first trip, there's about 13 trips that I took for it. Um, the first trip was in March, 2017. That was in the Arctic. And the last one was to Bahia, Brazil. And that was in December 2019. So I kind of did it backwards over over two and a half years. I mean, I did it out of order, basically. And I, I mean, I knew that I was going to insert my opinions in the book. I knew it was going to be a first person book. That's I do first person journalism generally. But I did not think that it was going to be a memoir until probably the last couple drafts of the book proposal. And yeah, and I don't I don't remember exactly why, but I think 
I just felt like historical nonfiction can be a difficult thing to relate to people unless you can show them how it relates to you. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I mean, I think that using first person narratives, it just kind of gives people like a, a vehicle, a vessel to sort of live the story through. Now, when I really started to become a, I guess, a character in my own book with more of an, with kind of an arc that I was setting out to, I guess, explore, it was one of my earlier trips. I went to Trinidad and I kept being greeted and treated like a Muslim brother and kind of expected to pray with people and I found that people were opening up to me because they thought I was, you know, a pious Muslim person and not necessarily as like a journalist, more like a, just like a curious brother. And I felt very conflicted about that. So I felt like I needed to be more after that. I felt like I, I really need to be a lot more transparent with my subjects, but I especially needed to be more transparent with my readers and let them know sort of where I'm coming from, what my biases are why I have these biases. And that ultimately led me to explore more of my, you know, personal experiences growing up in the faith. So the book proposal process, how did that evolve? I mean, I knew that I wanted to write a book. I'd ghost written two books already with Simon oh, really? Schuster. Yeah. And they really liked working with me and they were basically like, okay, what do you want to write now? You know, we're interested to, in publishing one of your books. And so it was, it was quite a like privileged opportunity. I worked with my agent on a couple of ideas and that's how this came about. Like I, I you know, I told her what I was interested in and what I wanted to do and what I want to set out to do. And I had an idea of writing about Islamic history in Canada, actually. And she was like, too small. Like, you have this opportunity uh -huh. to sell an international, you know, a, to sell a book to Simon and & Schuster and, and tell an international story. She was like, why not America? Or North America, rather. I was like, well, why not the Americas? Uh -huh. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of how it started. And I probably spent about two or three months doing historical research and uh, putting together maybe the first draft of the book proposal. And it went through seven drafts before it went to the publisher. And we only sent it to the one publisher because they gave me a great offer. And that was that. Nice. So the travel part of it, you visited like 40 to 50 mosques and then yeah. honed in on like 13. 13 of them, yeah. So how did you pick, how did you cast your mosques? <laughs> and <laughs> what were the travel logistics of that? And I guess you knew that it was going to be set up. So there was some funding. And did you have to supplement that? Like, how did that work? Yeah, uh, I got a pretty good advance, you know, but like a pretty good advance for a book, but not a lot of money for travel. Right. You know, the the travel ended up costing about twenty thousand dollars on its own. I think maybe more actually. So I supplemented that with grants. I don't know what the situation is like in other countries, but in Canada, <laughs> not as good. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of grant, a lot of like funding sources for the arts. I mean, it comes from our inferiority complex with America and this perpetual fear of Canadians that we will not have any culture because American culture is so dominant that oh. we have to we have to subsidize it. And we also have to, you know, restrict the amount of American content that is on our airwaves and in our, I don't want to say in our bookstores, but maybe there are rules against certain percentages. I don't know. But basically there is a decades long effort at like every branch of <laughs> of government here to support and encourage the development of Canadian arts. And that's why we have all these grants. So I was able to secure about $20,000 from three separate branches of government and, and sort of arts councils. God bless Canada. That is amazing. Yeah. I mean, I have a friend who has received $70,000 so far to oh. write 
to write her first novel like what will be her first published novel now i mean it's it's an amazing idea and it's an important book and she she obviously has been writing some incredible excerpts and outlines in order to get this funding but yeah i mean it exists <laughs> um, so yeah yeah so that's that's how i did that as far as picking the mosques it was a mix of sort of i guess triage and triangulation <laughs> I knew that, you know, some mosques, believe it or not, are kind of famous. So the first mosque in Canada, which is actually here in Edmonton, is mm-hmm. one of those famous ones. The uh, Islamic Center of America in Dearborn, which is sort of seen as like the Middle Eastern and, and Muslim hub of America, also another famous one. You know, it's one that like Washington sends diplomats to in order to improve Muslim relations. So there are some mosques like that where it's like, yes, those I want to know their mm-hmm. stories and tell their stories. Um, other times it was like, you know, with Trinidad, I went there, I probably went to 10 different mosques and I was looking for one that best represented the story of that country. And that country is like Muslim population. Other times I just kind of like stumbled upon this in my research and I was like, yes, I need to get there. So that would be the mosque of of an indigenous Mayan community in Southern Mexico that I was not expecting. I was like, I need to be there. And then, you know, situations like that would make me decide also what some of the redundancies were. So there was a there's a mosque in Argentina that I wanted to go to, but it was a little redundant of the Mexican one. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of how I how I cast them, I guess. So then are you writing as you go or did you wait until the research was done and then plow through a draft? How did that work? I tried to write as I go because you know each chapter could have been its own book and it was a Uh lot of information to hold in my head and I knew that I could not possibly retain this information very well I'm also like no matter how many notes I take right I will forget you know what's in my notes and I just end up having to like do the research again so I did my best to avoid that And it went well for the first while, and then it all fell apart, and I ended up writing probably the last half of the book after my last trip, after, you know, returning from Brazil, which, you know, it made things really difficult, but at that point, I didn't have a choice. I just, I was, (laughs) it's what I had to do. But if, I mean, if I could do it again, I'd give myself more time. I would have avoided distractions, you know, articles, assignments, any other things that came up. Uh Uh-huh. I think I made a documentary in that period. <laughs> so, you know, no regrets there. That I mean, that was my first first film. But I think I just would have just given myself more time to make sure that there was like maybe three months between each, you uh-huh. know, trip and draft. I didn't need a, a clean draft, but, you know, I, I needed probably like, you know, a month of research before the trip, a week of the trip, probably two to three more weeks of like more research and outlining and transcribing and note taking, and then a month of writing for each chapter. Mm. So if I could do it again, that's what I'd do. Yeah, that's smart. But I mean, I get it. We travel for private parts unknown, and sometimes you just can't control all the other no. stuff that is going on in your life. So and it's also it's also kind of an episodic book. It can be read out of order. Right. And each chapter doesn't connect so closely to the next. So but other books, you know, books with more tighter narratives, you probably can't do that. So you finish a draft that you send to Simon and Schuster. What was the editing process? Yeah, it changed. It started with like edits on the first couple of chapters that I delivered, um, just to kind of like set the tone, um, make sure that we all sort of agreed on like the right structure and kind of finding a bit of a blueprint for each chapter. And then once that was done, then I was just sending, like I kept sending things along as they came, but I was receiving them in big chunks. And I think like at the end, it was like the last four remaining chapters just kind of all came together. And then it was a little bit more, you know, contained after that, where it was like Uh edits on like a full draft 
going back and forth, but it was all bits and pieces, totally out of order until that point. Interesting. So yeah. how long, I think I heard you say like it was supposed to take one and it took three years or whatever. Like how, oh, how yeah. long was the process? Yeah, I think I signed, I mean, I must have signed that book deal in summer. I want to say summer or fall of 2017. And I seem to remember a year or maybe a year and a half deadline from that point. And um, yeah, no. You were like, I'm still traveling, so. <laughs> yeah, a year, yeah, I was. I was still traveling at that point. I got I got some got some extensions and then COVID hit and that delayed things as well, probably added another six months. But you're like sending them chapters. Yeah. I'm so working. they know you're working. They're not worried about it. Yeah. And you know what? That's that's honestly that's part of the reason to also send chapters, you know, piecemeal like that. That's a good hack. Yeah, it's a good <laughs> hack. Yeah. Buys you two extra years. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm curious about the fact-checking process for a book like this. Yeah. Fact-checking in books doesn't really exist unless you as an author make it exist. And this is this is one really? of the yeah, this is one of the things I struggle with the most in publishing. One of my first jobs in the industry was as a fact checker for a magazine. I was an intern, but like large, probably 50% of my job was fact checking. It's something that I don't just take it seriously, but I actually take joy in it. And I just have so much respect for the fact checking process. So it was, it was quite discerning to realize, not with this book, but with the first couple books that I that I ghost wrote that there was no fact checking process. You know, there's a copy editing process and in that they might check the spellings of things mm-hmm. or correct geography, something like that. But um, no, no one's no one's looking at your sources. And so I asked for a fact checker and time to fact check uh-huh. and my publisher. They were so accommodating this whole process they assigned one of their editorial interns to do about half the fact checking, all sort of like the low hanging fruit uh-huh. um, that they could fact check by checking for sources online. And then I spent about a thousand dollars to hire a fact checker, a professional journalist and a friend of mine. She probably deserved two thousand dollars for it. She fact checked sort of the the higher hanging fruit, the stuff that you might actually need to call someone Uh and say, like, what did you mean by this? Did you actually say this? Can you confirm this? That kind of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I I believe that fact checking should be done independently of the writer. But if I didn't have the money for that and if I didn't, if the, the publishers didn't have the resources for that, I would have to do it myself. A book with a topic this sensitive, I just, I, I would not be able to, I just wouldn't be able to sleep. And look, there were errors. Really? In every chapter. Of course, of course. I've been a fact checker. I know that there has never been an article. I think there's never been an article that I fact checked over, say, 500 words that did not have an error in it. Everything has an error in it. Unless... It, like everything that hasn't been fact checked has errors in it. I can say this categorically because I've seen it. I know it. You're so right because sometimes, okay, I'll do like a radio story or whatever. And just in the handing over process, just in me turning it over to the digital team or whatever, even if everything's right on my end, there will just be like, this is four people running down the green and it's really three people or you know what I mean? Just in that process, I'm like, oh my God, you're so right. Everything has an error. Everything. You have to have a second pair of eyes to comb through it. We don't really have those resources in publishing anymore. Newspapers never really did this because newspapers, you know, they can run a correction the very Uh next day. I think magazines, which would print, you know, weekly, monthly, bi-monthly, quarterly, biannually, they have always been extra cautious about this and invested in that, but less and less so these days. I think they are maybe using their online platforms as a bit of a crutch to Uh excuse 
cutting their fact-checking resources because they can now also correct things immediately when they learn them, which is great. But also, what about the printed version that's sitting on the, you know, in the doctor's office for the next two years? (laughs) That is very interesting. I saw that there's no Audible yet, so I want to know if you're going to be voicing (laughs) the audio book. But I got to tell you something amazing. I learned recently that the first book I ever wrote called Amazing Cats. (laughs) I love it. Are you familiar with this book? No, (laughs) but I love the title. I'm already on board. In 2008, I wanted (laughs) desperately to be a writer. I was searching Craigslist, Craigslist for jobs, and I found a job that said something like, looking for writers to write true stories about cats. It's like, okay, hi. Uh, I've published a couple articles. And this is it. (laughs) That is amazing. It's called Amazing Cats, Stories of Intuition, Compassion, Mystery, and Extraordinary Feats. I found out by accident two months ago in May, I found out that they made an audio version of that book last fall. I don't know why. (laughs) 13 years later, they would make an audio version of that book. I'm curious. I think I'm owed royalties, so I'm going to have to look into that. Oh, my God. I'm going to have to go check that out. I'm going to have to listen to Amazing Cats. So, yeah, (laughs) Praying to the West, not on Audible yet. Amazing Cats on audible.com. You can can get it with your free credit. (laughs) So, wait, are there plans for an audio book for Praying to the West? Currently, no. No, we're working on the plans for the paperback version. Okay. It's a slow rollout. Yeah. Okay. So your book came out during COVID. What was the book tour experience like and the reaction? Yeah, the reaction was great. I got really positive reviews and feedback right out the gate. And, you know, I just I felt super lucky and and grateful for that. But, um, you know, there wasn't really I mean, there was a virtual book tour, which was busy, uh-huh. um, but it was also a virtual book tour, right? And it was in September, October, November of 2021. So, you know, by then people were pretty Zoom fatigued. Right. And so they just weren't coming out to online events as much. So, th- you know, it was it was quiet. Like it was fine. I had some great conversations. It also like really worked out for me personally and for my family personally because it meant that I could do this all from home at a very busy time. Um, My last documentary came out at the same time in September of 2021, so it was nice to be home for that, but I didn't actually go travel for my first like book festival until last May, like until May 2022, and that was wonderful. They treated us so well. And I was like, oh, my God, I really missed out on like Uh the author experience. I really, really missed out on it. And I was so happy, but I was also a little bit sad, (laughs) you know, and kind of sad for like younger writers, too. You know, those ones who do have the energy and and maybe the, you know, excuse to travel and um, and have so much to benefit from that experience who don't get didn't get to have it on their you know, on their first books. There's there's always going to be more books. Hopefully uh-huh. there will be more experiences, you know, book tour experiences. But um, yeah, you know, it's it's uh, it was a bittersweet thing. I, I went to the Fold Festival, the Festival of Literary Diversity in, um, in the Metro Toronto area in Brampton. And so it was a bittersweet experience. They sent uh, the authors to the airport in a limo. Oh, they were shit. really like, you know, these we were like sick kids. They treated us like <laughs> sick kids who'd like just come out of the Ronald McDonald uh, um, house. They were like, oh, they've been they've been through so much during this <laughs> pandemic. Like they really they really deserve this. You know, <laughs> that's sweet, though. It was so sweet. I saw that you had got you've gotten to go to some award shows. I think you won. Recently. Yeah, I recently was awarded one of the Lieutenant Governor of Alberta's Emerging Artists Awards. Congratulations. Thank you. And the very next day, received the Wilfred Eggleston Nonfiction Prize, which is the top nonfiction prize in the province for Praying to the West. Amazing. Your parents and your family look super proud of you. So that was adorable. Looks can be deceiving. Yeah. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. They are. They are. And I'm, and I'm, 
you know, super grateful to have like such supportive family members. You know, p- people have, <laughs> when people ask me like, how'd you write this book? It was such a daunting effort. And it's like, yeah, I married like an extremely supportive person and have like a really supportive mother who looked after our kids when I was away for 25% of my uh-huh. child's first two years on earth. It meant a lot. Actually, you know, when I when I won the Wilfred Eggleston Award, I went up there with like, you know, a, another planned speech and I just started my... <laughs> My I brought my daughter. Um, uh-huh. She was my plus one. And as I went up there, I looked across the room and she was just licking the the like <laughs> pamphlet, like the program for the award show, just to see what it tastes like. And I just I started <laughs> laughing and I just started like thanking her and then my wife. And the next thing I know, I was just crying. Oh, yeah. I was thanked her, my wife, my mom and like the women in my life who've supported me and made like literally made this book possible to write. And I just started crying. (laughs) Oh, okay. That's beautiful. And with that, we will go to our postscript segment. (laughs) (laughs) Let's do it. First of all, what's next for you? Can you share anything you're working on? And any bucket list writing goals? Yeah, I'm working on a feature version of the short documentary that came out in the fall called The Last Baron, Mm -hmm. um, which is about a rogue burger chain called Burger Baron and how it became kind of a pathway to the immigrant dream. It came out on CBC Gem in September was quite popular. And, you know, from that response, we started crowdfunding and investing for a feature. And I'm working on that right now. And it should be ready to submit for festivals by the end of August, I guess. And then we'll see. Hopefully it'll be in, you know, its first festival in January, hopefully, which also happens to be when Sundance is. So, you know, high bars. Yeah, I believe I believe in high bars. So yeah, that's that's what I'm working on right now. A couple of the things here and there, but that's that's the big one. Like I said, I have one big project at a time. That's my big project. And what's what's the bucket list? Oh man, um, praying to the West kick my ass, and I don't think I will write another reported nonfiction book for a while. Oh. Um, maybe a few more years. It just it was just so it took so much out of me. But I would like to, I think I'd like to start writing some more fiction. I have an idea for a novel and about a fourth of it that I completed three years ago now. I think it's time to dust that off. But actually what like my dream project and hopefully I should be able to start this by the end of the summer is to write a a feature screenplay about... um, Frank Lactine, who is a distant cousin of mine, who is the first Arab American movie star and lived a incredibly fascinating life. I learned about him in the process of writing Praying to the West, actually, and wrote um, kind of the definitive article on him. He was a very, very complicated man, a silent film actor who basically played every ethnicity, always negatively. He kind of sold out racialized people in order to be accepted as an American. And that in itself was a struggle. I mean, he was repeatedly turned down for his American citizenship and, you know, in the end died like very, you know, very sad and and, and destitute and never how he actually felt about his choices, about his movie choices. I'll never know. He never spoke about it publicly as far as I, I can tell which is why I think it needs to be fictionalized because I'll, I'll uh-huh. never I'll never know what was in his head. But I would love to write that. I would love to write that script. Fuck, that sounds fascinating. Okay, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> um, <laughs> what is one piece of writing advice you wish you could give your former self? Um, <laughs> it kind of relates to what I just said. The time to write speculative work that is like work that you're not being paid to write necessarily is when you're young, you know, or at least before you have a lot of 
you know, financial and familial obligations. Yeah. Because with the novel and with the script, I mean, these these have been bouncing around my head for so long. And I, you know, I remember even before college in high school, I would just have like an idea for a movie and I would just go write the script. And I had like three screenplays written by the time I went to college. And the idea of doing that now, I'm like, I just don't know how. Like when I got to write a birthday card on spec, I feel like I have to like plan <laughs> for it. You know what I mean? So block out my calendar for yeah, this. Yeah, you know, before you're <laughs> before you're like kind of financially handcuffed to commercial work, even commercial work that you love to do, but like contractually obligated work, try to get the the passion projects out then. And also not just get them out, but also like build a routine and a practice of writing for writing's sake, like writing, you know, speculative works, because I never developed that practice. I've been a professional writer since I was um, fucking young. You know, I've been a professional writer since I was 20. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've, I've just been like really focused on making a career out of it and you know <laughs> with my gains building a life for myself and so yeah i just i never developed that practice fuck that's good advice okay one tip for writers trying to get a book published um i think in the in the book proposal process try not to get caught up in the comps part of it which is like the comparative books this is a non-fiction thing but i also think that when you're putting together a you know, a proposal or a query letter with a with a, a novel or a work of fiction, they the publishers expect you to compare them to other books and kind of make a case for why the market deserves your book or wants your book. And it is just the reality is the market is a crapshoot, right? And nobody can really <laughs> nobody can really predict what's going to be a successful book or not from from comparative titles. And, you know, the the creative nonfiction writers that I work with at King's University here, um, this is the thing that causes them the most amount of anxiety. And I'm I'm here to tell you it's it's probably the least should I say the least? <laughs> it's one of the least important parts of your book proposal, in my experience. And I say this because I didn't have comps in my book proposal. And that book sold. So don't get caught up in it. You know, it's good to have, but like, don't stress about it. Don't overthink it. Yeah. And it's a time suck. It is. To go down the rabbit hole of like, what? It's a suck suck too. <laughs> um. Okay. What's your all time favorite piece of your own writing? Well, there's, there's a investigate, a comedic investigative piece called Will the Real Burger Baron Please Stand Up, which became the movie, The Last Baron, which- ah! I didn't give you the new title. The feature title is The Lebanese Burger Mafia. Um, <laughs> and till this day, like I've I've written maybe a thousand articles. And till this day, this is the one people want to talk to me about. You know, it's it's I mean, it's a very Western Canadian thing, this Burger Baron. But it's, you know, it's like, what's the deal with them? Why do they all look different? Why do uh -huh. they have like they all have like weird different logos and why are they all Lebanese? And, you know, it's such a mystery. And that, and, and it is, that's why I wrote the piece and tried to find out who the original Baron was and found out that there were multiple people claiming to be the inventor of this. It's just a really fun and kind of sincere, you know, article about being an immigrant son to like owners of a family restaurant in this diaspora this like lebanese diaspora in alberta with a burger chain at the center of it oh i love knowing that that's part of the evolution of the last baron and now oh, yeah. your feature that's yeah. so cool i am a, kind of obsessed with iterating on work in that way where it's like one form and then it you know turns into something else and oh, something yeah. else i love that i do this all the time my other documentary, Digging in the Dirt, which is about mental health and, and suicides in the Alberta oil patch, oil and gas industry, I wrote three articles on that topic before that 
documentary was developed. And it was developed kind of the combination of two iterations because my co-director, Dylan Reese Howard, had made a, unbeknownst to me, he'd written and directed a um, scripted uh, short film about the same topic, about oh. like an oil worker who was becoming more and more desperate and hopeless. And after he read one of my articles and he told me about his movie and we we're like, well, there's something Synergies, here. Yeah. yeah. So. Oh my God. Go. I love that. Okay. Well, this has been fantastic. This has been great. Thank yeah. you. This is so fun. Everyone should check out Pandemic University, which is how we know each other. And I've taught a couple classes for you through Pandemic University. And how else can listeners connect with you online? You can connect with me on MSN Messenger. I'm just joking. <laughs> Follow me on Twitter. Twitter's the best one. Uh, it's Omar Mualam. I'm sure the spelling of my last name will be in the show notes. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, thank you. This has been amazing. And the rap, chef's kiss. <laughs> God, I already regret this. <laughs> So that is it for this edition of The Bleeders. Thanks again to Omar. What a fun interview. It was so great to get to know more about this aspect of his multifaceted career. And if you missed the last episode with Nenada Kwasa Cherma about how she went from blog to book, here is a little preview. So I came from the holiday thinking like, why has it taken me so long to feel like I can have this kind of community that has this really positive attitude about sex. And, you know, I felt inspired that I wanted to start a blog about sex. So I rang up one of my very good friends, Malika Grant. She lived in the States at the time. And I said to her, let's do a blog. And later on, we can turn it into a book. And that's what we did. Like she also wrote two series that she started on the blog that became books. So we both have, in a sense, books that have been inspired by some of the writing we've been doing on the blog. Thank you for joining me for this episode of The Bleeders. Ah, oh, writing is so much better with friends. I'm your host, Courtney Kosak, and let's connect on social media. I am at Courtney Kosak, K-O-C-A-K, on Twitter and Instagram. And make sure you're signed up for The Bleeders Companion Substack. Hot tip, I send out a lot of good stuff in there. The link is in the episode description. And of course, join me again in two weeks for another episode. In the meantime, happy bleeding. <laughs>